Good morning, Professor Eng Seng Ho, Director of the Middle East Institute, Your Excellencies from the Diplomatic Corps, respected professors and researchers, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Middle East Institute's Arabia Asia Cluster Conference entitled A Northern Tier in West Asia, States, Networks and Informal Diplomacy. Without further ado, I am pleased to invite MEI Director Professor Eng Seng Ho and MEI Fellow Dr. Sirkan Yulchan to give their welcome remarks. Professor Ho, the podium is yours. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to the MEI in Singapore, and especially a warm welcome to our uh, guests from far away, from places such as Russia, um, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, and of course to our guests uh, from Singapore. Uh, some of you may be wondering uh, what you are doing here. Singapore is not usually on your circuit. Uh, and I would confess that this is an unusual clutch of characters for us to be bringing together in uh, Singapore, MEI. But let me just give you a little um, idea of what of the uh, thinking behind this, this uh, gathering. Uh, in Singapore, as many people here know, uh, we see ourselves as uh, being at the crossroads of Asia, uh, a place where the dense interconnections uh, across different parts of Asia, which were very strong in the pre-colonial period, uh, got kind of um, um, went down during the colonial period, during which um, Indonesians would go to Holland, Malaysians, Singaporeans would go to London, uh, Filipinos would go to Madrid, and so on. Um, with the end of colonization, we see these neighboring countries re knitting their relations one to another again. And this re knitting in the past 20 years has become something which we call uh, global supply chains. So the interaction, the density of interactions across uh, what I call old geographies, is something which is very dramatic in Singapore today. And it ties together the old historical geographical um, phenomena with very contemporary and future-oriented developments as well. So this is um, what we see and experience in Singapore. Where the Middle East Institute is concerned, what we want to do is hook up this um, sort of inter-Asia with the Middle East, because the Middle East is part of these inter-regional connections, which Singapore is uh, not only a part of, but has always been shaped by. So this is what we do in MEI. Uh, but we've been doing it more on the oceanic circuits across the Indian Ocean. This is what we're very familiar with. What we have today um, with this West Asian conference is we're taking this sort of perspective and shifting it north in the Middle East, north up to the Turkey, Iran, Russia, Central Asia uh, position, a more northern position. But we recognize in this clutch of countries a similar sort of thing whereby uh, you have these basically interconnected regions. And people think of interconnections more easily when it comes to oceans and water. They don't think of interconnections so much when it comes to mountain ranges and things like that. So, But we are thinking of uh, interconnections across mountain ranges, across deserts, uh, this sort of thing. And if we to sh were to shift the perspective up to this uh, Russia, Iran, Turkey triangle, then that is something which we think is of interest. And there are two in a way, reasons for this interest. The first is, of course, uh, the very dramatic developments taking place today in the Middle East, especially, say, in some place like Syria, where you see the Turks, the Russians, the Iranians have to coordinate with each other, deal with each other very closely. The Americans and the Israelis are also there. They're all dealing with each other very closely. Uh, people who want to exaggerate say that the, the Third World War could start there, but we see that the Americans, the Russians, they coordinate, the Israelis, they coordinate very closely, the air bombing and things like that. But whatever it is, these things are coming together in some place like Syria in a very uh, dramatic contemporary fashion. 
part of it, you could say, might have to do with the withdrawal of the Americans, starting with Obama, from this region, making a vacuum to which the Russians can come in. That is true. The Russians are coming, and they're coming today with airstrikes and so on, at, I would say, at very low cost. At very low cost, but with very high levels of, um, of uh, benefit. So we see today, very dramatically, people who hate each other, the Saudis, the Iranians, the Israelis, they're all making a beeline to Moscow. So that is something uh, very dramatic, uh, um, almost mind-boggling, you would say. Uh, but in a way, uh, this is, is this the new Middle East? Is it simply uh, these few years? Will it have longer legs going forwards? We don't know. If we stick to simply a contemporary perspective, I don't think we can chart out uh, the, uh, any sort of analytical framework or even longer-term political framework to think about these things. So this is why we also have historians at this table. This is why we also have anthropologists at this table. The reason is you have this contemporary phenomenon tying this weird geography together, but if you look at a lower level, if you look at trade, if you look at the journeys people have been making since the decline of the Soviet Union, if you look at the rise of Dubai, you have these inter all interconnections being re-knitted again today, and this is something which we are very familiar with, with which we've seen in Singapore for the past uh, 30 years. So apart from, let's say, the war in Syria, you have had a lot of tourism between Egypt and Russia. Uh, you have fruits and vegetables going from Turkey to Russia. You have uh, Iranians, you have uh, Azeris um, doing gold and all kinds of deals between Iran, Turkey, and Russia. So you have this older layer of interconnections across this region. And one of the things we want to do at this conference is to put together these older Geog social geographies, the historical views, the diasporic views, together with the contemporary politics to see what, uh, whether we can come up with something, to get a sense of whether there, 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 there are legs to this um, re-knitting of things uh, in, in this part of the world. Um, we also think that there may be certain models. If you think of Iran, Turkey, and um, Russia, these were the three big empires of the region for a long time. Um, they became nation states, um, but now they, um, because of um, the way superpowers have been operating, these what you might call middle range powers are reasserting themselves. And if you think of this part which we call the Middle East, uh, these are countries which are the big mass uh, Play, players in the region. They can put troops on the ground. They have staying power. If we were to con, con, contrast this northern tier to then a southern tier where we have Arab countries with small populations, uh, perhaps wealthier, uh, technologically uh, more advantaged, uh, that gives you a different uh, sort of model. If you think of, say, something like military engagement, you have air power, you have uh, high tech, is it sustainable? You don't have boots on the ground. So I think in this sort of sense, a northern tier brings up the idea of a southern tier and what are the two different kinds of models. Uh, this is also quite interesting. And of course, when you think of these two models, you think then easily of a territorial model versus a maritime model. It goes back to these old things. So for these reasons, we think that there is uh, something here, and we are very happy that all of you can come and help us think through, think through these issues. I will um, pass on the um, torch to Sir Khan. I will, I will uh, end by saying that um, Ahmad Davutulu, who we think is quite a visionary guy, uh, said at one point that we cannot change our neighbors, but we can change how we think about them. And so today, we are happy that you are all coming here to help us think about uh, all your old neighbors. Thank you. Delighted to welcome you all to our conference. If you allow me before I set the agenda today, uh, I want to thank the MEI team uh, who made this uh, possible with uh, their diligent work, Ms. Huda, Ms. Jamalia, Ms. Sharon, Mr. Romel, Mr. Harold Fazri, Mr. Wayne, Mr. Calvin, and Mr. Garda. Uh, please join me in thanking them.
I'll, I'll, I'll start with the recent development. Um, on the news last week was the re-election of uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan as Turkey's president with new sweeping executive powers. This, new, this news is relevant to us here today because his entrenched leadership provides continuity for a regional development that prompted today's conference, namely the rapprochement among Iran, Turkey, and Russia over Syria. As Erdogan's relations with the United States turned sour, Turkey has been reorienting away from its transatlantic NATO ally toward its old neighbors, namely Iran and Russia, with whom Turkey shares borders, uh, pasts, and, and peoples. This reorientation away from a distant ally to closer uh, rivals have resulted in an intense diplomatic traffic. The frequency of uh, trilateral summits among the presidents, Rouhani, Erdogan, and, and Putin, have led some analysts to already uh, speak about a rising trio with a newfound influence in the Middle East. Uh, some, some call this a marriage of convenience, drawing our attention to uh, the irreconcilable differences in, the, uh, in these countries' political agendas in the region. And this may very well be true, but it also misses the point in that what brings these leaders, three leaders together around the same table is not a full convergence of their interests. It is rather the shared willingness to play together despite such contradictions. And the key to it is to proceed with partial solutions to their problems one step at a time. And who knows, maybe with each step, these three powers may learn how to pursue diverging interests in the long term without stepping on each other's toes. And I would argue that it is such diplomatic elasticity which again, arguably, gives this trio a greater diplomatic weight in the Middle East, as uh, Dr. Ho said, compared to the, uh, their counterparts, Arabs and the Americans to the south. What is interesting is that this, this sort of elastic diploma uh, diplomacy, driven by strong leaders and partial solutions, embolden other leaders to come in and capitalize on this opening. A good example of this is the Kazakh president, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who soon after broke a peace between uh, Erdogan and Putin in the wake of the Turkish-Russian jet crisis, turned the Kazakh capital Astana into a neutral ground of sorts where the foreign uh, ministers of Iran, Turkey, and Russia regularly meet and to sort out their differences and uh, try to broker a peace in Syria. And much to the surprise of many, the Astana process has been much more effective, so far at least, than the UN and US-backed Geneva process, which has uh, produced nothing but a blame game. Another leader who is riding the tide is the Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev, who has been stepping up his economic and diplomatic engagements in all three directions, and I found out last night that actually he's also uh, extending his operations into uh, Central Asia, which is uh, a new development. In 2016, he brought Rouhani and Putin uh, to Baku, where they discussed matters relating to energy, transportation infrastructure, and security across the Caspian. And just a few weeks ago, uh, Aliyev was in Ankara for the inauguration of the Trans-Anatolian National Gas Pipeline that transports Caspian gas to Europe via Georgia and Turkey. This project is, uh, is important because Iran is also interested in joining the project by linking up its natural uh, gas supplies to the same pipeline. And the pipeline, which can also link up with the, nat the supplies in Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan. And as far as I know, Turkey and Azerbaijan have been lobbying these two countries to join the project as well. It is sitting in Singapore, it is not a stretch to see all these routes as potential extensions of China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which looks to connect 
East and West Asia via Central Asia. So countries like Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and others will possibly play an important role. And all this is a sea change from 10 years ago, when these small states had to choose from alternative regional orders pushed onto them by competing regional powers. You are probably familiar with these visions as Turkey's neo-Ottomanism, Iran's Shia Crescent, Russia's neo-Eurasianism, and so on. In the last couple of years, these competing projects, projects seem to have receded, clearing space for a broader cooperative climate whereby the small states like Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan can take on a very proactive role, use their in-between position, and turn their uh, country into a platform where a new vision for the wider region can be defined, at least negotiated, through the give and take of international diplomacy. Of course, in their interactions, these states, big or small, uh, do not rely on only the tools of formal diplomacy, but make use of a whole range of non-state actors, such as businessmen, pilgrims, scholars, religious leaders, traders, contractors, and so on and so forth, who can take on the role of messengers and mediators between states. Interestingly, these figures do not have diplomatic immunity. That's not, uh, where, uh, that's not why they're effective. To the contrary, their effectiveness derive from the social and cultural immersion that these uh, characters uh, built in, in more than one country. They're often plugged in networks that span across uh, multiple countries, and they usually have stakes on both sides of the border. Historical memory, cultural tastes, previous contexts, family reputation, religious background, linguistic ties, and business interests all play a role in the cross-border interactions of these, what we can call, informal diplomats. For example, when Turkey and Iran exchanged gold for gas some years ago by passing the international sanctions, the whole operation has been carried out on the back of an Azeri businessman who had Iranian and Turkish citizenship and had connections in Baku, Dubai, Istanbul, and Tehran. So in short, cultural and business exchanges are not incidental to geopolitics, but they lie at, remain at the heart of it. And today we see an intensification of such exchanges, uh, something that uh, Professor Ho uh, alluded to, which also became evident to me in, uh, during a recent visit to the Caucasus, where a growing number of Gulf Arabs and Iranians are paying frequent visits to, the city, to cities like uh, Tbilisi and Baku, also Yerevan, where they open businesses, buy property, or simply have fun. And this is a sea change as well from just five years ago when the visitors to these uh, cities in the Caucasus were predominantly from Russia and Turkey. And similar processes can be observed in other urban centers across the northern tier and places like Istanbul where Russians and Central Asians intermix with Turks, Arabs, and Iranians. Now these human networks and their interactions and their histories often fall through the cracks of our received geographical categories, which separate the Middle East from Russian Eurasia and Central Asia. Today, we will use the advantage of being in Singapore and we'll call the whole thing West Asia. <laughs> and uh, because West Asia is a category that can connect the Middle East to Russia, Central Asia, uh, the Caucasus, Turco-Persia in the north, and to the rest of Asia in the east. So it's an expensive category. And having placed it in this larger framework, we can finally pose the question of this conference, which is that do we see a rise of a northern tier in West Asia? And if so, what concepts, symbols, histories can we use to capture the cultural and political shape of this contemporary geopolitical tier. At first glance, northern tier doesn't make sense because no cultural trait dominates. This, this wider region has different religions, ethnicities, even different imperial histories that do not overlap. So we lack 
readily available symbols to use to capture the cultural interlacing across, across this geography. And this brings me to um, the samovar you see on our conference poster. Uh, you may have been wondering why on earth we chose the picture of the samovar for a conference like this. Uh, maybe the previous picture. The previous one. Yes. So as some of you know, samovar is a, is a Russian word meaning self-boiling or self-boiler, uh, which made its way across the northern tier where this kind of uh, teapot, uh, well, this is an earlier version, actually, uh, is called uh, samovar, 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 etc., etc. While I was aware of samovar's journey as a word, two weeks ago, during the, the same trip to the Caucasus, I learned something new. When a, new, when a tea enthusiast in Tbilisi explained to me that Russians adapted the current form of samovar from the teapots carried by Iranian tea sellers who walked the streets of Tbilisi and Baku in the 19th century. So while samovar as an object traveled from south to north via the Caucasus, its name, given by the Russians, traveled in the other direction eventually acquiring a wide usage across the former imperial domains of the Turks, the Iranians, and Russians. So to me, samovar, both in name and as an object, perhaps it's a fragile symbol, but nevertheless, it's a symbol of the historical interconnections and cultural interlacing across the northern tier. Samovar also conjures up the image of informal gatherings. We can go to the next slide, where Discussion of important matters unfold in tandem with the exchanging of pleasantries, gossips, and gifts. And perhaps that speaks to the nature of interaction across the northern tier today. I'm aware so Samovar is certainly not enough to argue for a shared basis across the northern tier, but uh, it is a starting point nevertheless. It's a starting point to think of historical and cultural crossings in the past and to ask whether the range of exchanges that happened around some of us have built any social basis for states today to draw on in their interactions. Or is some of us just a fragile strand in a sea of mutual distrust, bitter memories, and incompatible vision? It's an open debate for us today, and we will tackle these questions throughout the day. We will start with a round table where we will uh, tackle the big questions first, head on. And after that, we will delve into the possibilities of the northern tier in detail with three panels. These panels will interrogate the infrastructures available for the present actors in the form of shared pasts, human capital, and energy supply routes. At the end, we will come back to these questions and ideas aired in the opening roundtable, and re-evaluate re them in light of three panels. I hope it will be a fruitful discussion for all of us, and uh, our shared insights will benefit scholars and practitioners alike. Now, to, cook, to kick it off, I invite our three speakers for the opening roundtable. Thank you. Welcome again to our first roundtable. I will introduce our speakers today. And the format we will follow is that I will ask some initial questions, and then we will have 10 to 15 minutes for each speaker, and then we will open up the floor for uh, discussion. Our first speaker is Dr. Elena Suponina. She's an advisor to the director of the Russian Institute for Strategic Studies. She is also an expert of the Russian Council on International Affairs and head of scientific reviews for the problems of National Strategy Journal published by RISS. Prior to this, she was founding director of uh, RISS Middle East and Asia Center from 1992 to 2013, an extended version of uh, her uh, biography you can find in the booklet. Um, our next speaker, is uh, Hamid Reza Azizi. Uh, Dr. Azizi is an assistant professor at Regional Studies Research Institute at Shehid Beheshti University in Tehran. 
He's also an adjunct lecturer at the Department of Regional Studies, University of Tehran, and a member of the scientific board of Iran and Eurasia Studies Institute. And again, an extended version you can find in uh, the booklet. And our final speaker, uh, Dr. Brandon Friedman, is the director of research at the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies at Tel Aviv University. He's also the managing editor of the Dayan Center's journal, Bustan, the Middle East Book Review. He teaches the history of the Middle East during the modern period in the BA Liberal Arts Program, which introduces students to important themes and issues in the region during the last 200 years. So I will start first with uh, Dr. Uh, Sponina. And of course, our focus will be on Russia. To me, Russia has two faces. One is the global and the other is the regional. Globally, when we look at Russia, we see it being dwarfed by the two giants, the US and China, economically and, and otherwise. But seen from what we call West Asia, Russia is a dominating uh, country, a power. And perhaps its involvement in uh, West Asia has been a byproduct of the Syrian crisis and has been perhaps accidental in that way. But the, the, the relationships, the connections, uh, the power that it has established so far uh, also makes me suspect that it, Russia will be with us in West Asia for a very long time. First of all, would you agree with that, that, it, that this is going to be a long-term involvement uh, in, in, in the rest of West Asia, especially given the history of Russian involvement in or Soviet involvement uh, in, uh, in, in the region from the late 19th century all the way through the Cold War until today. And if Russia is to stay in West Asia, and in, then what kinds of resources, actors, networks, uh, populations Russia has in terms of keeping this wide uh, presence in the region. Thank you, Sir Khan. Uh, thank you, Ensign, and uh, all of our uh, organizers of uh, our meeting here, very well organized, uh, by the way. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I think Russia has uh, multiple faces, not only two faces. And uh, about how long Russia will stay in the Middle East, uh, uh, I'm sure that many players in this region, they want uh, for Russia to stay uh, for a long period of time. Uh, but uh, I will try to explain why we are here now, or why we are in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, it's my pleasure to be here with you in uh, Singapore. Uh, where West meets uh, East and East and uh, North meets uh, South, uh, and despite uh, famous Kipling's uh, quotation uh, that uh, saying East is East and West uh, is West, uh, and uh, never the twain shall meet. But here in Singapore, uh, they met, in my opinion, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, when I read these days uh, Western political analysts writing uh, about the Middle East, I found, find them uh, citing not from uh, even Kipling, but uh, sometimes from John Locke and uh, Thomas uh, Gobbs. Uh, both, uh, as you know, are British uh, philosophers from the 17th century. One of them, John Locke, uh, was saying, uh, what a blessing to be born uh, in the time of storms. Uh, uh, I think for us it's also the blessing to be born uh, in this time of big storms, uh, not only in the Middle East, but uh, uh, entire of uh, all world. Other one, Thomas Gobbs, uh, is famous by his uh, Bellum omnium contra omnes uh, in Latin means uh, the war of all against all. Uh, some experts uh, cite this now with regards uh, to the Syrian conflict. 
I ask myself, and maybe I ask you also, why most of uh, them of uh, Western analytics, uh, why uh, most of them are remembering those English philosophers from the 17th century? Is it because they believe that the conflict in the Middle East will end finally in a manner similar to the treaty signed in Europe, in Westphalia, in 1648, uh, that brought stability and new principles of uh, territorial sovereignty and uh, 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 territorial integrity? Uh, to the Europe? Uh, why not? Uh, if yes, so is it possible in this global world of uh, smartphones uh, and uh, computers uh, to, to find uh, such new treaty and uh, to achieve such cardinal uh, change, change for the better in this very complicated region without interference and agreement between outside powers? like Russia, United States, Europe, and uh, Asia. Uh, but also, in my opinion, the agreement between uh, Middle Eastern uh, powers uh, is uh, strongly needed. Uh, uh, because of this, Russia's objectives is to talk to everyone in the Middle East, uh, except, of course, terrorist organizations like uh, Daesh, uh, uh, Islamic State, or uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, it means uh, Al-Qaeda. Uh, and uh, unlike the USA, uh, Moscow continues uh, to maneuver and to preserve the balanced uh, links with the Arabs, the Jews, the Persians, and the Turks. You know, maybe it's more easy, like uh, America is doing, to declare Iran uh, uh, not good state and not to deal with, uh, with it. But uh, Russia is trying to maneuver in because it's not possible to find the solution for Syrian crisis without uh, 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 without to take in, in account uh, Iranian interests, uh, as well as Saudians uh, and Israel's and the others. So the task is uh, very complicated. Uh, that is a big challenge to preserve such a unique position and to maintain the balance of powers and uh, relationship in the Middle East. But uh, as you found, uh, Russia is quite successful in this. Yes, one of the reasons uh, of Russian military operation in Syria uh, th that started uh, 30 September uh, 2015 was to defeat international terrorism, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. But now Russia is trying to convince Western and Eastern partners to join in the process of economic recovery and reconstruction in Syria to help UN and Syrians with political reforms. Um, for example, uh, uh, we started uh, uh, with uh, the team of uh, Stefan de Mistura, uh, the work on uh, constitutional reform in Syria, and, and it, it could be one of steps for next future elections uh, in this country. It's not only a political <coughs> wish. Uh, this is also a wish of uh, all Russian people, or of most Russian citizens. The Russian Levada Independent Polling Organization, Levada, Levada Center, reported in summer to 2017, uh, so last year, that half of all Russians were in favor of concluding the Syrian anti-terror war campaign. Uh, while uh, uh, less of citizens, about 32%, uh, supported continuing the war. So we need to remain in Syria, but uh, with our two military bases, but we need to see this conflict be ended. Uh, the 
negotiations between the government of Syria and opposition in Russian point of view is uh, very necessary and this is key stop to uh, this is key step to stop fighting in Syria also is needed to divide the um, moderate opposition from the Islamic state and Jabhat al-Nusra and now uh, our foreign minister uh, Lavrov uh, asked uh, Americans uh, to help uh, in this very difficult uh, case. Uh, it's possible to do it, and we think that our American uh, partners uh, could be more active in this. As you mentioned, Sir Khan, there are three platforms for this kind of work. One in Geneva with the UN team of uh, Stefan de Mistura, and the other one in uh, Astana in Kazakhstan, and the third one is quite new, is uh, in Russian city Sochi on the Black Sea. Uh, the Astana process was created by Russian initiative uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, 2017. The three pillars of the Astana process are Iran, Turkey, and uh, Russia. Uh, Turkey and uh, Iran uh, has uh, a need to work closely with Russia, and uh, three of them uh, have agreed last year to be g guarantors of a ceasefire in four Syrian areas, in Idlib in the north, uh, in around Homs uh, in the center, uh, also in eastern Ghouta, nearby of uh, Damascus, uh, and uh, the first, uh, fourth one uh, in uh, the south of Syria, in uh, uh, the province of uh, Dara. Uh, this idea helped uh, to maintain ceasefire in uh, these four regions, it helped also to bring back some of uh, those territories uh, under the cont uh, government control. It helped also to deliver more freely humanitarian aid to population uh, there. Uh, yes, uh, the situation in Idlib, uh, in the north of Syria, is very complicated still. Uh, and uh, now there is a military operation uh, in the south, in uh, Dara province, uh, but uh, uh, eastern Ghouta is quite okay, and uh, Homs uh, is quite uh, stable. Uh, later, uh, this fourth zone in the Dara, in the south uh, province, uh, was maintained also by the strong coordination between Russia, US, and neighboring Jordan and Israel. So it, this is also quite uh, new. Russia now is cooperating not only uh, with the participants of Astana process, but also uh, with the other players uh, in the region and outside of this region. Yes, about Astana, sometimes uh, each of three members uh, uh, of this process, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, has different views in regards to some military operations, like uh, during Turkish campaign uh, uh, in Afrin, in the, in the north of uh, Syria, when Kurds uh, are living. But in regards to the main problems and principles, there are not any disagreement between three of them. The main task for three of them is the need to preserve uh, serious sovereignty and territorial integrity, and also to uh, achieve a political solution for long Syrian crisis. A month ago, I came back from Russian military base Khmeimim in Syria, where I spent a couple of uh, days. I saw there the painting from one very simple Russian artist, the painting of a bear distributing bulletproof jackets for white pigeons, white toves, symbols of peace. Uh, and the peace inevitably will come, I'm sure. 
but the picture reminds me not only uh, of Russian fairy tales, but also of uh, Chinese, often remembering today Mao Zedong well-known saying, the political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Thank you, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sponina. Why, why don't we uh, continue with, uh, with uh, our uh, two other speakers, and then uh, we'll finally open the floor for uh, Q&A. Uh, Dr. Azizi, I would like you to continue on the same theme uh, in the sense that uh, how um, seen from Iran, whether uh, the term West Asia uh, has any meaning and uh, you, the foreign minister has been using it on purpose for a while now, but uh, probably it, hasn't, it doesn't have a wide usage uh, among the Iranians themselves, but Iranians are living it as a reality, I would say, because they are, uh, in my experience, I, I, I see Iranians in the Caucasus, in Turkey, in Dubai, in uh, Iraq, and they go for very different reasons. It's a very layered geography of Persian-speaking people from uh, Iran, and Iran, uh, despite all its uh, economic and political problems at home, can and prove proves to ha you know uh, capitalize on this uh, on on these uh, uh, networks. Sometimes very soft, sometimes very hard uh, with revolutionary guards, etc. So I would like you uh, to uh, sort of uh, draw on 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 this uh, picture and then give us a view of uh, how 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 this is all seen from Iran. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers of this uh, interesting event about an interesting topic. Uh, actually, uh, uh, when uh, Serkan invited me for this conference, uh, when I uh, got the first email, uh, I was thinking, uh, what does it exactly mean uh, to have a North Center in uh, West Asia? Um, uh, you know, actually, I want to say that uh, it's a kind of uh, new discussion, even uh, for us as as the people who live uh, inside this uh, vast territory. And uh, after that, I decided to uh, put my focus on uh, the uh, you know uh, three main angles of uh, this uh, northern tier, this so-called northern tier: uh, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. But now, uh, today here, uh, I uh, faced with uh, some more interesting thing, I think, uh, as uh, Serkan noted, about uh, the term itself, the term West Asia, and how it, uh, it's seen inside Iran, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, either uh, among the politicians or uh, among the public opinion. So, uh, I want to, first of all, uh, you know, have a, a short discussion about this issue, and then uh, maybe I can go through uh, some other aspects regarding the three uh, uh, so-called main pillars of uh, this northern tier. <clears throat> uh, as Serkan mentioned, uh, the term West Asia is uh, widely used uh, in the um, you know, official narrative of, of uh, Iran uh, by the Iranian politicians, by the foreign minister, by the president, and by the others. I can say that uh, we can uh, differentiate uh, three uh, main narratives regarding West Asia. Uh, the uh, official narrative, uh, the second one is uh, academic narrative, and the third one is uh, public opinion. And each of them have, uh, has uh, some, some kind of different viewpoint toward this issue. Uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, politicians, when it comes to the official, uh, you know, uh, narrative, uh, the term West Asia has, uh, it could be said that, has been in, invited uh, in order uh, not to use uh, the so-called uh, colonial word uh, Middle East and to emphasize on uh, the distinct nature of uh, these territories as, as a kind of uh, independent and, uh, you know, uh, self-relied uh, entity, the West Asia. But, uh, um, and uh, it went through, uh, it could be said that uh, some uh, different uh, phases uh, from 
uh, from a period of uh, passive approach uh, to a kind of active approach. The passive approach was mostly during uh, the uh, years of uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's uh, presidency. You know that uh, during that period, uh, the term uh, look east uh, had uh, become a kind of uh, official narrative in a kind of doctrine, it could be said that. Uh, a doctor in, in uh, Iranian foreign policy, but uh, why I say it was passive? Because uh, it was uh, somehow reaction uh, to the pressures imposed by uh, imposed on Iran by the West, uh, and uh, it's in intensified, uh, you know, during uh, b uh, as a result of the sanctions. Uh, so. Uh, it could be said that uh, the Iranian administration at the time uh, passively uh, tried to uh, somehow uh, actually uh, look to the east to compensate for, uh, for the losses in the west. Uh, but uh, it didn't work out well because uh, the confrontational viewpoint of Iranian foreign policy at the time uh, caused the states uh, in in the region. I mean, when they uh, talked about East, it it, it has a kind it uh, had a kind of uh, vast uh, definition uh, from Russia, China to even uh, the Latin American countries. Uh, even the Latin American countries were defined as as parts of uh, that uh, you know uh, definition that term. Uh, but uh, because of because of those uh, kinds of uh, confrontational positions uh, at the time. Uh, the, uh, even those countries uh, didn't, uh, you know, welcome uh, Iran's uh, uh, Iran's desire to uh, initiate a kind of rapprochement. But uh, since the time uh, President Rouhani came to power, uh, it could be said that a kind of active view, um, you know, replaced uh, the uh, passive one because uh, one of the main aims of President Rouhani. Uh, President Rouhani's foreign policy and uh, Mr. Zarif's, uh, you know, uh, doctrine in foreign policy was to uh, pursue a kind of balanced approach in foreign policy. And at the same time as uh, they uh, uh, started a serious uh, process of negotiation to solve the nuclear crisis and try to uh, reach a kind of rapprochement with the West, uh, they uh, um, attempted to uh, improve the relations with uh, with the uh, countries that uh, Iran's neighborhood, uh, exactly the northern tier. I mean, uh, uh, mostly the uh, Caucasus and Central Asia and and uh, in, uh, the other countries. And uh, it was successful this uh, this time because. Uh, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, th these uh, kinds of interactions uh, has still, uh, I mean, uh, the, the interactions between the West Asian countries, or it could be said that Eastern countries is, uh, are still dependent on the uh, viewpoints of the governments uh, toward the West. When, when we, uh, you know, uh, when, we, uh, when you can uh, reach a kind of rapprochement with the West, uh, it uh, facilitates your uh, interactions with the East. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, decrease of uh, those kinds of uh, sensitivities uh, toward that countries, uh, together with uh, Iran's uh, pragmatist approach uh, toward, uh, toward those territories, uh, resulted in uh, a very good uh, you know, development in Iran's relations with the South Caucasus. Uh, as we can see that uh, the visa regulations with uh, Georgia and Armenia uh, uh, were lifted and uh, with Azerbaijan that we had uh, a long period of uh, uneasy relationship. Uh, we reached uh, a kind of uh, similar arrangement on visa on arrival uh, for the Iranians. It was something uh, real new uh, at the history of uh, at least uh, the Islamic Republic. Uh, so uh, I can say that uh, uh, from the time that uh, President Rouhani came to power, uh, this uh, active approach toward, uh, towards uh, foreign policy uh, uh, together with uh, that uh, kind of uh, reluctance to uh, use the term uh, Middle East because of uh, its uh, colonial uh, you know, roots uh, caused uh, the term West Asia to be used in Iran. Uh, when it comes to the second, uh, you know, uh, uh, the second group, uh, I mean, uh, when we discuss about the uh, academic narrative, uh, 
uh, I can say that it's not uh, um, still, at least, uh, really common to use the word uh, West Asia. Uh, actually, uh, 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 mostly the, uh, the scholars who work on uh, geopolitics uh, use West Asia as a kind of uh, um, geographical uh, concept, uh, but uh, in the sphere of international relations, regional studies, my field of study, uh, it's still not uh, widely used uh, because, uh, you know, uh, part of the issue uh, uh, relates to uh, the lack of uh, real definition uh, for the region. Uh, where is West Asia exactly? Uh, where is the place of, uh, for example, uh, North Africa in uh, in this equation? Uh, from uh, from where to where we can uh, define uh, West Asia and things like this. So it, it still needs uh, more academic uh, scholarly discussion. Uh, but uh, the uh, I can say that uh, the alternative that uh, is uh, that has been recently. Uh, actually in use uh, by the um, academics who uh, work on uh, the um, areas of international relations and regional studies is Eurasia. Uh, this uh, Eurasian identity and trying to define it uh, as a kind of uh, new phenomenon uh, in uh, you know Iran's foreign policy has become uh, really uh, you know, uh, come on in in uh, the um, Iranian uh, academic narrative, and uh, part of it uh, is uh, related to the fact that um, uh, many scholars now in Iran uh, define uh, international relations as being uh, in a kind of uh, transitional period, and and they emphasize uh, the role of uh, rising powers, most importantly China and uh, the necessity uh, for Iran to uh, define its uh, role in, in these new e equations, th these new uh, international equations. Uh, so um, uh, all of these uh, initiatives, I mean, um, uh, most importantly, uh, China's One Belt, One Road initiative and uh, Russia's uh, Eurasian Economic Union, as well as uh, the initiative of a North-South uh, Transport Corridor, all of these are now studied in, uh, you know, within the framework of uh, Eurasia, uh, in Iran's uh, academia. But um, I still, I um, again can say that um, it's uh, not widespread. But uh, the first steps uh, has been taken, and the third category, I mean, uh, the public narrative. Uh, I can uh, definitely say that uh, if if you come to the streets uh, in Iran in Tehran or the other cities and uh, and you ask people about West Asia, no one can answer where is West Asia and, and if they, are, uh, they know that they are at the uh, heart of West Asia. Because it's not, uh, you know, been uh, somehow uh, rooted uh, in, in the public opinion. Uh, and uh, uh, I can say that uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the term uh, West Asia, uh, no one, no one still uh, uses it. But when you say uh, Middle East, uh, I can say that uh, the, uh, every taxi driver can uh, analyze all the <laughs> problems of uh, Middle East for you, from the American involvement to uh, the issues of Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and 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 the other parts of the region. Uh, but um, there is an interesting fact uh, referred to by Sir Khan and the public interactions. I mean. Although uh, at the official level there's not some kind of uh, Eurasian identity formed uh, b between the Iranian people uh, that uh, could relate them to the, to the uh, people of uh, South Caucasus, Turkey, uh, Central Asia, and, and the other uh, countries of the region, uh, a kind of uh, you know actual uh, trend uh, has been happening. Uh, that uh, uh, is uh, connecting uh, these people together. Uh, the interactions between Iran and Turkey has been uh, somehow uh, in place for many, many years, although uh, the relationship between uh, Iran and Turkey has been in many cases uh, somehow uneasy or uh, there, has, uh, there uh, have been some tensions in the relationships, but uh, a huge part of the tourists uh, which uh, visit Turkey every year uh, are the Iranians. Uh, but uh, what is new is, is the interactions between Iranian people and uh, with, uh, with the South Caucasus and, and Russia. Uh, and uh, it happens as a result of uh, the work of the first category, I think. I mean, uh, as a result of that kind of balanced approach uh, replaced uh, 
in the Iranian foreign policy because uh, now the Iranian people can easily to, uh, go to Tbilisi, to, uh, uh, to Yerevan, to uh, Baku, and uh, it was interesting, it, it was just in May, uh, I, uh, I was traveling to Tbilisi for a conference uh, and uh, uh, I realized that, uh, because it was at the time of holiday, I, I realized that uh, there's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, the flight before our flight was uh, um, was just half an hour earlier. I mean, uh, base, uh, on a half an hour basis uh, was uh, were flights uh, to Tbilisi in the holidays. And uh, the same applies to Russia. I remember the first uh, when I went to Russia, it, it was in uh, 2014. Uh, I uh, needed uh, a kind of uh, uh, official invitation to be sent to the embassy uh, via uh, official TLEX and uh, some, uh, you know, uh, complex uh, procedures. But now we can uh, just uh, do it in a matter of, uh, uh, you know, half a day. So uh, many people, uh, many people come and go. Many people are uh, interacting with each other, with with, uh, with the population of these uh, countries. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, if if uh, we want to uh, somehow uh, conclude uh, these uh, um, kind of three categories, I can say that um, that kind of uh, West Asian uh, identity. Uh, the inclination, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the tendency to uh, to use it uh, uh, as uh, as something real has been uh, already uh, formed uh, in the Iranian official narrative. It's been in the process uh, in uh, the Iranian academic sphere, but uh, in in the public opinion, it uh, takes time, I think. But in uh, uh, it's happening it uh, in the actual uh, sphere. How much time do I have? It's, it's over. So it's over. Okay. Continue. Okay. <laughs> For the other part, yeah, of uh, course. we can continue in the Q and A session. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Azizi. Uh, now, Dr. Friedman, uh, we have been talking about Northern Tier, uh, and uh, particularly these three countries: Iran, Turkey, and Russia, and their connections in Central Asia and the Caucasus. But this, in geographical, in uh, geopolitical terms, this puts a rift between. Uh, these countries and uh, the rest of uh, the Middle East in a way, particularly uh, the Gulf, in also including uh, countries like Egypt uh, and Israel and so on, uh, maybe with a, sort of a shared frontier in Iraq, Syria, uh, in Qatar, Kuwait, countries like that. Uh, do you, in a way that, that is misleading because there, there are uh, crossovers and these countries uh, have diplomatic relations, they share populations across the border, etc. So how, uh, how do you see this northern tier idea? Uh, uh, how, how, with, with a, I would like to ask if you see a development of a northern tier in West Asia, but also, in, if so, in response to that, can we speak of a southern tier as such, made up of uh, um, predominantly Arab countries in the Gulf uh, with uh, a strong alliance across the Atlantic with the United States. And if uh, you say a few words on, on Israel's position in that as well. Thanks. First of all, uh, thank you, Sir Khan. Um, uh, your generous host as the, is the Middle East Institute here in Singapore, and I'm happy to be here um, for the first time. Uh, it's also an honor to share the stage with my two esteemed and distinguished colleagues from Russia and Iran, Elena and Hamid Reza. Um, Sir Khan, at your expense, if I would, just a small joke uh, regarding your introductory remarks. Uh, you mentioned, mentioned Kazakhstan as a small country uh, <laughs> sitting in Singapore, uh, 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 and I, I live in Israel. Uh, Israel is a small country. Kazakhstan, I was in Astana last summer, is a very big country. Uh, but but I, I think I caught your meaning, uh, so you forgive me for that. Um, so I was asked to speak today about whether a southern tier is a viable concept in relation to a potential northern tier, and, and can the two coexist? Uh, that's how I understood the question. Um, in, in short, if you asked me, uh, in, uh, I would say no, uh, but the reality is much more complicated and nuanced. Um, 
and I'll spend a few minutes explaining that in a minute. Before I do, um, I want to give, uh, give you some idea of how uh, we in Israel may be thinking and how our political leadership today seems to think that a southern tier is quite viable, at least as you outlined it, Sir Khan. Uh, and in order to give you a good illustration of it, um, I'd like to, if possible, show you a minute, it's, it's literally a minute and 30 seconds of a government pro promotional video that was issued, um, I think two weeks ago now, um, about a plan to build basically a regional uh, 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 railway between connecting uh, the Israeli point of port of Haifa with the um, Arabian side of the Persian Gulf. Um, and I'll use that as an introduction to, to uh, a little bit further uh, trying to explain this southern tier, northern tier dichotomy. Um, so if we could maybe run the video. I apologize, it, it is in Hebrew, but the graphics are in English. So you will be able to, if you look at the graphics, you'll be able to see the English. Um, and uh, I'll basically, some after the video is done, uh, or a minute or 30 of it, uh, summarize some of the points in Hebrew. מסילות לשלום אזורי, הינה יוזמה פורצת דרך לחיבור הקוותי של הים התיכון למפרץ הפרסי. בבסיס היוזמה, שני רעיונות מרכזיים, ישראל כגשר יבשתי וירדן כהאב תחבורתי אזורי. רשת מסילות אזורית תשנה המטענים ובעתיד גם נוסעים בין ארצות הברית ואירופה והים התיכון במערב לבין ערב הסעודית ומדינות המפרץ במזרח. היוזמה תיצור נתיבי סחר אזוריים קצרים, מהירים, זולים ובטוחים יותר, תתרום לכלכלות ירדן, הרשות הפלסטינית, סעודיה, מדינות המפרץ ובעתיד לעיראק. היוזמה גם תגביר את הפעילות בנמלי ישראל ותמריץ את כלכלתה. התשתיות שכבר קיימות בישראל, סעודיה והמפרץ, יאפשרו ליישם את היוזמה בלוחות זמנים קצרים יחסית. רכבת העמק בין חיפה לבית שאן, המבוססת על התוואי ההיסטורי של הרכבת החיג'אזית, נפתחה מחדש ב-2016. הקו יוארך עד לגבול עם ירדן, למעבר נהר הירדן שייח חוסיין, וכן לכיוון מעבר ג'למה ואזור ג'נין, שם יוכלו הפלסטינים להתחבר לקו מערבה, וכן מזרחה לירדן, לסעודיה ולמפרץ, באופן שיעודד צמיחה כלכלית ותעסוקה ברשות הפלסטינית. בירדן יוקם נמל מטענים יבשתי גדול. Thank you for bearing with me, and I'm sorry I didn't have a version in English I could show you. The idea, and I think that the graphics conveyed it, was that Israel would serve as a hub between trade, transiting between the United States and Europe through the Mediterranean, um, to the Middle East or West Asia, and then trans, uh, trans, uh, I guess being transshipped from uh, Haifa, the Israeli port, through to Jordan, which the video described as becoming a new um, sort of hub for trade in the region, and then on to Saudi Arabia and uh, the, uh, the Saudi coast and the coast of the United Arab Emirates. Um, and uh, this plan was basically rolled out last year by Israel's Minister of Transportation, who also happens to be Israel's Minister of Intelligence, Yisrael Katz, uh, who is a very senior member of the ruling Likud party. Um, many, of, many Israelis will look at this mega project um, with a great deal of skepticism because it's talking about the thousands of kilometers of infrastructure, and after all, uh, we in Israel are still waiting for our high-speed rail link between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, a mere 56 kilometers, to open, and it's been under construction for more than 15 years. Um, but in, in all seriousness, it, it makes sense to think about this proposal in terms of uh, local, regional, and international uh, uh, lenses. From the local perspective, it, it may be that Katz, the transportation minister, was trying to raise his own profile given the current state of uh, domestic politics. At the regional level, um, I believe that this plan uh, is meant as a trial balloon um, for 
a potential forthcoming uh, what's known as the outside in uh, U.S. proposal to jumpstart the Israeli-Palestinian peace process again. Uh, and relatedly, it could also be viewed as uh, a means of reinforcing what's being perceived as growing ties between Israel and what the video refers to as the pragmatic Arab states, uh, and specifically referred to as Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates, who are increasingly exploring potential regional security cooperation with Israel in response to how they view Iran's role in the region. Um, at the international level, and this may be of interest to those in the region here, Katz's plan could either serve as a complement or a potential competitor to the Chinese proposal that would link or connect Israel to the Belt and Road Initiative through an Eilat to Ashdod high-speed rail link. This proposal, in turn, raises the broader issue of global economic drivers behind the demand for this kind of infrastructure project, as well as the, the, um, the issue here at hand today, which is the question of regional relations. From a historical perspective, it's interesting in the sense that this plan replicates the uh, large portions of the Ottoman Hijaz Railway, um, particularly the Haifa to Nablus branch line, which was a project that was begun in 19, er, uh, carried out between 1900 and 1909, which was intended to expand the Ottoman Empire's military capabilities, particularly in Syria and the, and the Arabian Peninsula. And it was also meant to legitimize uh, the Sultan uh, Abdul Hamid II uh, in Istanbul. But to return to the more narrow issue at hand today, the central question addressed to this panel is that, yes, a southern tier in the eyes of Israel's current political leadership is viable, indeed desirable. I would argue that at this stage it's primarily aspirational, but I would also be hesitant to dismiss it as pure fantasy. What's more, Israel already serves as an active and robust commercial link between the northern and southern tiers of today's West Asia. A significant portion of Turkey's exports to the Arab world transit through, through Israel to Jordan. Bilateral trade between Turkey and Israel has hovered between 4 and 5.5 billion for each of the last three, three years. In 2017, Israel exported 1.4 billion in goods, American dollars, 1.4 billion, and imported 2.9 American dollars, 2.9 billion. Um, Israel mainly exported chemicals and refined oil while importing textiles, cars, metals, and machinery. This trade has continued over the last four years despite the tenuous state of political relations between Israel and Turkey. And it's continued, and, and those relations have been poor for nearly a decade. Should the political context stabilize, which I admit is unlikely given the current re-election of Turkey's President Erdogan, a pipeline that delivered Israeli natu natural gas to Turkey would offer another area for stronger commercial ties linking a prospective northern and southern tier of West Asia, particularly given Israel's uh, existing plans to deliver gas to Jordan. As it stands today, however, Israel is more likely to construct a pipeline to Europe via Cyprus, Greece, and Italy rather than through Turkey. However, the prospect of a functional and cooperative northern and southern tier in West Asia, despite being both aspirational and to some extent real, faces considerable obstacles at the local and regional levels. Now, in, in the interest of leaving time um, for the q and I, I, I won't get into all of those reasons and, and you know, looking at the pre-conference papers of my co-panelists, I think we share many views, many of the same views on this notion of a northern tier. I'll just say this uh, as sort of broad background since I am a historian by training. The opportunities for a northern and prospective southern tier and the opportunities I've been discussing are primarily commercial. But historically, the concept of a northern tier, which is a Cold War, essentially a Cold War concept that traces back to the interwar period, um, is a strategic one. Meaning, it emerged, the, the notion of a northern, northern tier, which originated with Iran, um, uh, Iran and, and Afghanistan uh, and Turkey during the interwar period, was to manage relations between the British and the Soviets as sort of a neutral zone. 
And then after World War II, it became a central arena of competition in the Cold War initially, but then really became an area of stability. But it was always a strategic conception, meaning it was not a commercial conception. Uh, and when you look at the question of what the converging interests are with the northern tier today, it's been the Syrian war that's pushed uh, Iran, Turkey, and Russia together um, as a prospective northern tier. And I would argue that it's been that, that, that those relationships, for a variety of reasons, um, have some deep seated tension uh, built into them, uh, which make me look at a prospective northern tier with a great deal of skepticism. And that also applies to the southern tier as well, which is basically a grouping today, in theory, of countries in the region that see Iran as a threat. Okay, And so if that situation were to change, we then in the region would have to ask ourselves, is how robust is this idea of a southern tier? Um, because the southern tier also faces the chief obstacle of the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, and, and so when we begin to think about these northern and southern tiers in strategic terms rather than commercial terms, it becomes a much more difficult uh, uh, circle to square, to mix my metaphors, or to square the circle. Um, I just want to finish with two key thoughts. And one of them, and it chiefly refers to Russia. I think it's wrong to think of Russia as a constituent member of a northern tier. Russia is a global power. We should be thinking of them as an architect of a prospective northern tier. And when we look at the northern tier in history, Russia was never a constituent. You could say that uh, the former Soviet Union um, and its relations with Britain were ostensibly the reason for the emergence of what became the Sadabad Pact in the late 1930s. Um, you could also include the rise of uh, uh, fascist Germany and Italy in there, and then obviously the Cold War. But so my two, the two points I'd like to leave you with are this. One is we can talk about the northern and southern tier in a variety of ways, and I think most fruitfully in terms of its commercial possibilities. But that would be ignoring the, nature, the strategic nature of these groupings, um, and I think that that's a mistake. Because ultimately, the geopolitical forces will always trump the commercial interests. Okay? And, and I know that that's fairly unequivocal, and I'm open to discussing it. The second issue is Russia today is, this is perhaps Russia's moment in the Middle East. And I know that might be seen by some as a bit of an exaggeration. It's played a critical role in coordinating with all parties in Syria. It's been actively coordinating global oil policy with Saudi Arabia today, in lieu of or in parallel to OPEC, raising the question of how valuable this OPEC grouping really is anymore. Russia's also expanded its military basing rights and energy interest in Egypt, in parallel to a rising China in Egypt. And the crisis between Qatar and the Saudis and Emiratis has not affected Russia's ties with either side in the dispute. In fact, Russia has pers persuaded almost all of the wealthy Gulf states to make substantial investments in Russia's economy, mitigating to some extent the effect of Western sanctions post-Crimea. So returning to the core assumptions, and I'll finish here, um, I would say that we can think of a northern and southern tier, again, best as perhaps a, a way to manage great power competition in the region, whether we call it West Asia or the Middle East. However, at the great power level, Russia has already demonstrated that despite a contracting economy and a diminished population, it has retained the important tools of a great power, as well as the ability to use them to great effect. So if the great power relationship, and this is the assumption we haven't examined, that needs to be managed in West Asia moving forward is that of China and the United States, it would be important to remember that, China, that Russia too is a great power. And it's effectively positioned itself between the US and Europe and China on the other hand 
in order to maximize its freedom of action and avoid being subordinated to either the West or China's potentially hegemonic ambitions. Therefore, today, Russia's role as an arbiter for West Asian security warrants much more careful attention, um, particularly at the level of great power competition. Thank you.